Let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. Our guest on This Week in America, Ed Galashevsky, author of Simplifying Religion, Ask, will religion survive? Should it? It's no secret that younger generations are leaving organized religion in large numbers. Their exodus speaks loud and clear to the fact that there is a generational divide today that spans all faith groups. Not many people have wanted to tackle this issue because of its difficult, often touchy subject matter, but that didn't stop Ed from jumping in with both feet. He reached out to those walking away and bluntly asked why, and thankfully they bluntly answered him. Ed's been called a real-life Joe Palooka, a big, good-natured guy, a men's ministry leader for 20 years. Ed has ministered to literally thousands of people. He's been in and out and in again of church, learning to overcome his own struggles with the institution while still loving the body of Christ. Ed and his wife, Lynette, have two children, son, Braun, daughter, Bryn, live in Littleton, Colorado. Ed Galashevsky, author of Simplifying Religion, Removing Barriers That Keep Us From God, Family, and Others, our guest on This Week in America. Hi, Ed. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you, Rick, for having me. It is my pleasure. So much to talk about during the program today. We'll give you information on Ed's book, where it's available, including his website, as we go through the program. Let's talk about the motivation, taking on a topic that so many people really don't want to jump into, and you did, as I said, literally with both feet. What might have motivated you to write Simplifying Religion? Yeah, well, it really started with my children. I was watching uh, them when they got to be uh, high school age, and they were they're, they're millennial age now. They're 31 and 32. But when they were 17, 18, I was watching kind of some of the trends in their life. As they went off to college, I was monitoring both them and all their friend group, all that millennial group when they were 19, 20, moving through their 20s. And boy, oh boy, did I see a mass exodus with those that age group not wanting to attend regularly on a Sunday morning. I sat down with a bunch of them and was having coffee with them and would just say, hey, talk to me a little bit about what what is motivating you, you know, to do things in the world of religion and, and what's taking away that motivation, what's robbing you of that. And they were very honest and open. Uh, so when, when I saw the religious landscape and kind of the trends that were going on, I also did a little research and realized that uh, two two major groups in America, one called Pew Research and one called Barna, both Pew and Barna basically came up with titles for this millennial and Gen Z group. They call them the nuns and the duns, N-O-N-E-S and D-O-N-E-S. And if uh, if your listeners want to do a little Google on that, it really speaks to that mass exodus that's going on. That's fascinating. The book is Simplifying Religion. Ed Galashevsky is our guest on the program. That's G-A-L-I-S-E-W-S-K-I. The book is Simplifying Religion. His website is Simplifying Religion. You'll find uh, information on uh, Ed there, information on the book, be able to order that as well. This topic, I'm sure, has a lot of mixed opinion people even simplifying religion. It's like, how can you do that? I'm sure mixed reaction out there. What's been the response from those who have read the book? Yeah, so it's been, uh, the the difference has been amazing. When I handed it to my baby boomer uh, friends, so the people that are in my age category, kind of in that 55 to like 70 age category, uh, I, I I handed it to them and I said, "Tell me what you think." They they were um they were shocked, and they also told me that it was a little bit of a turnoff because the issues that I speak to that are causing this divide, they were saying that they they're not on board with that. That they you know they they were fine with these issues, but then when I handed it to their millennial uh, children and grandchildren, all of those millennials looked at me and said, "Ed." that it is spot on. These are absolutely the things that have been turning us off. So the older generation was not wanting to kind of hear it. And the younger generation was saying, thank you. 
Thank you for writing something that gives me a voice that speaks to the things that I'm struggling with. So to me, that was, I really thought that both sides would be like, oh, thank you. We want to deal with this. Yes. But it yes. really was mixed. <laughs> Is it true to say young people seek authenticity? Did you find that as you were writing this book, uh, Simplifying Religion? Absolutely. And it's uh, there's a chapter in there that called uh, that's called What Makes Them Tick. And when I really did a deep dive and I had about 40 interviews with the, the millennial um, you know, population and they just said, look at Ed, we just want to be honest and open and transparent as to where we are, what we believe. And when they were trying to bring that forward to their parents or their grandparents to, to speak about this, they were starting to get into arguments and that they, they, you know, so I, again, the book is, is trying to give uh, something to start that much needed conversation or dialogue. But, but yeah, the younger kids were saying they just didn't feel that their voices were being heard, which who, is sad. Who is the target audience for simplifying religion? I can see this is geared to, to young people who have questions, in many cases have stopped being uh, uh, regular church participants. On the other hand, for older people, maybe these are issues they've dealt with for years. They just cast them aside because really we're not supposed to question that. Who is the book designed for? What age group? Yes. So I, I thought it was going to be first. I thought we were going to market it to the boomers because they, these were my my friends who were wondering why their kids were not going to church. So I thought, oh, right, we'll just start with the boomer. But the more we started marketing and give it to some groups where they were kind of test marketing it, we really found out that the millennials and Gen Z's were probably the ones most likely to read it because they were the ones that were struggling the most. But to your point, trust me, in my age category, 60-year-old guys, and I have so many friends that are struggling also. So I would say the, the best market for it were people that are struggling to stay engaged in the structural church. They're just, they go on Sundays, but they're just hearing things, and there's something there that just is a disconnect for them. So I, I really think it's more of the people who are struggling, those who are like drinking the Kool-Aid and go, I'm good with everything I hear and everything about religion I'm good with, it probably is not something that they're going to want to hear because this talks more about the plight of the discontented or the people that are disengaged. With us on This Week in America is Ed Galashevsky. He is the author of the book, Simplifying Religion, available, of course, uh, wherever books are sold and at Amazon. That's easy to remember, Barnes & Noble, any of the places. And Ed's website, which is simplifyingreligion.com. That uh, information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. What do you hope that Simplifying Religion will do for the, the current divide that's happened between the generations that, that you've talked about? Yeah, I, I really, I really, I hope and I pray that it starts that much needed dialogue between, say, grandma and grandpa and the grandkids, between mom and dad and their, their sons and daughters. Um, when we sat down with uh, uh, several couples where it was an older couple, younger couple, you know, again, grandma, grandpa, uh, grandchild, um, and we kind of asked them can you talk about this? Like, what, what, t tell me, you know, uh, are you able and are you willing? The sad part is that the baby boomer, the older generation, and, and this is the part that really just tugged at my heart, they really felt some shame that the kids were not following, you know, lockstep as to the things that they taught them. Yes. So we found yeah. that that the older generations had some shame. I talked to a psychologist about this. They said that's very real. You kind of want your children and your grandkids to follow you. And when they, they pushed back a little bit, there was some shame on their end. And then we found that the millennials and the Gen Zs, we said, can you speak to your parents about this? They said, we, we, we don't want to disappoint them. We feel that this will disappoint them. So think about those emotions you got going there, Rick. You got, you know, the, the, the parents are saying like, why don't they just follow everything I taught them? And the kids are going, oh, I don't want to disappoint mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. Oh, yes. So you have those things working against that, that honest kind of sit down discussion that needs to happen. Do you find that some of the young people would like to believe they just don't want to believe the way their parents and grandparents did? Yes, it, it, that that's that that encapsulates 
kind of what the what the what the, the the struggle is there, what the rub is there. The the older generation, and, and again, I put myself into this into this category. We always wanted certainty. We wanted somebody to tell us something that we can rely on. That yes. is one hundred percent. We and and I talk about in the book about that that need for certainty, where the kids are much more likely, and that they've said, "I'm okay with having." You know, not being so certain, having a little bit of mystery, it doesn't have to be figured out. So they have that concept where the older generations are going, it needs to be set in stone. Everything needs to be 100 percent, you know, perfect and and provable. And the kids are going, but it's not, you know, because of their, their like, no, the Internet, they're able to research things. So they were able to say, I- I'm OK with that. I, I don't need it to be 100% certain. That's that's one of the bigger themes, I think, that gets in the way. It seems like from what you've said, the disconnect is between the baby boomers, our generation, and the millennials, the Gen Z groups. What's at the core of this disconnect? Are there is there a reason, are there several reasons that uh, this disconnect exists? Um, yes, and it really comes down to, in the book, I talk about certain issues. I pick six of them. Because I just wanted there to be something where they could, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, discuss a little bit. But I mean, some of the things that came up, Rick, very prominent that kind of lead to that kind of where the people see things in different ways. Politics. We look at the concept of same sex couples and, you know, certain a certain generation would say, well, that absolutely can happen. That biblically that should not be happening. And the younger kids are kind of going, I've got friends that are, you know, that are gay couples and uh, we embrace them and we support them. The concept of hell, the concept of free will versus predetermination. These are all things that we, as we started asking, what were the things that were getting in the way? And then scripture, is it inspired? Is it inerrant? And the generations really were looking at that uh, extremely differently, and, and w- which is why when they were going to church and they were hearing certain things, they were going, oh, I'm, I'm not buying into this. So I, I, I tried to come up with six issues. There's other ones that, that people brought up to, women in leadership, things like that. But yeah, we tr- I tried to have the book be issue based on some of the chapters just so we can kind of, you know, get down to the nitty gritty as yes. to where we where we differ. This is a fascinating book, so well done, receiving excellent reviews. The book is Simplifying Religion, Removing Barriers That Keep Us From God, Family, and Others. Ed Galashevsky is the author and our guest on the program. I'll do the spelling as we go on, but if you uh, Google Simplifying Religion, you'll find it. Or if you're going to do Simplifying Religion, just put .com at the end of that. Take you right there where the, uh, the book is, and you can get information and read it. Uh, Ed, as they're reading the book, what lens do you want uh, the groups to to view simplifying religion through? What, uh, without a mindset before they go in, what's the best way for them, their mindset going into reading this, to uh, to do the most good for the religious divide that seems to be growing in America? Yeah, I, I really, my 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 hope is that um, when you have the let's say parents, grandparents. And they, they talk about having concern for their children, you know, feeling like they're disengaging from religion. I, I would hope that they would look at the book as a way to say, let me learn about my kids. Let me let me let me understand their point of view, how they see things, how they see things differently than me. So really, it, it put put on put on some glasses that that where where you you want more unity. You have a willingness to change, to adjust, to not be so dogmatic about stuff where it's like my way, it's my way or the highway kind of attitude. That's what leads to kids kind of saying, fine, we're not going to talk about this, you know, God bless, bye. And they walk away. And and a lot of kids are, are really going to more, you know, agnostic or atheist because they, they don't have a way to share. So I would say yeah, the lens, um, and that's a great question, the lens would be that the parents, the older generation, wants to understand and that the children say, you know, I I want you to hear me. I want to have a voice, but I want people to sit down and kind of move to more of a middle ground and just stop putting a line in the sand and saying, you know, that that my way is the way uh, that that gets nowhere. It leads to our current, you know, really where we're at right now, sadly, in this disconnect. 
When you look at the number of people who have stopped going to church, obviously there's uh, something in the current system that's that's turning people off. What what could bring the generations together? What are some of the answers? And I think you've touched on, uh, on many of those in, in the various answers during the, the course of the conversation. But what can the church do to like acknowledge this and then bring everybody together? Yeah, I, I think that the key is is that you just have to simplify things. I, I, each denomination, each group, and trust me, I sat down with millennial kids that were from Mormon households, Muslim households, Catholic, Evangelical, Presbyterian, I mean, you name it, all, all the different flavors <laughs> within religion, <laughs> yes. and all of them were struggling with adhering to kind of the, the you know, the, the older generation's attitudes and stuff. So just just keep it simpler. For, for in the book, I I come up with that concept of hope, need, and connect. Hope in a creator, something bigger than we can see. That there's an afterlife, you know, after we pass away. And then I, I talk about the need for a savior, you know, our sin nature, and saying just keep it to the point where it's a free gift and embrace that. I talk to kids from other other groups who were told to never, never, uh, you know, embrace or even think about the person of Jesus Christ, and they go. I'm kind of cool with who Christ was. Like when you look at his life, it was a pretty good life. It was yes. a humble yes. life. It was sacrificial love. So they're even open to that. So again, hoping to, hoping to creator need for a savior and that connect to that Holy Spirit when you have that that spiritual moment, that warm fuzzy where you go, I feel close to to God. I feel close to something spiritual is going on here. And you're like, ooh, I like that. That's kind of neat in your own prayer time or walk, taking a long walk or whatever it is that kind of gets you connected like that. So just keep it simpler. Stop all the rule-based stuff that each group has that just kind of keeps, it's really like almost like chains on us, you know, where it keeps us kind of, you know, it can, you know, we have to do what that group says. You know, it, it's fascinating. The book is can be self-reflective. We read it, people who are struggling, trying to get answers for ourselves or family members. The other side of that is is organized religion. You talk in the book about too often religious groups become more uh, focused on self-preservation. Talk about that, and should they be conducting surveys like you did uh, to try to figure out why people are not coming back to church, young people are leaving and not coming back? Yeah, and 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 believe it or not, Rick, they are being forced to do that. I don't think they want to. I think they'd like to stay the course because that's what that that's what worked in 1950 and 60 and 780. But the trends are, I believe, that they said of the millennial generation, which I think there's like about 64 million millennials, close to 60 percent or more have disengaged from or from structural church going on a Sunday they'll go with the parents on you know Christmas Easter something like that but but they're seeing this and they're realizing some of the the denominations are really losing people uh but you know really losing their 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 audience so to speak so they're trying to do this now so they're being forced to it I think the healthier ones are saying hey let's get in the let's let's be at the front of this but other ones are just real. I think they're they're kicking, you know, they're kicking and scratching where they don't want to. But they're they're doing this now, and they're hearing from the millennials. So I think the change is is happening, and I think the healthier ones that have more of a vibrant younger population are starting to speak from the pulpit about some of these issues and lightening up a little bit. So oh, it's happening. They're they're being forced to. Or they just basically just, you know, as people pass away, the churches get smaller, 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 and then they have to close the doors, which is also happening a lot. Well, it's happening a lot. The number of churches, or even now, I read a statistic, and I had to go back three or four times, the average congregation is like under 100 in uh, in churches across the country, and church buildings are vacant and they're trying to figure what to do with these to maybe serve a need in the community. The time is going by so quickly. Such a, a gripping book, Simplifying Religion. The author is Ed Galashevsky. The book available wherever books are sold, simplifyingreligion.com is his website. I want to talk in the remaining couple minutes here about what you went through, because you went through what so many young people are going through, leaving the church. You have been in, out, and in again. Are these issues, as you're talking to the people to find out why they went through this, similar to what you went through in struggling with making sense of religion? Exactly, yeah. I grew up back in New Jersey in a home that had a Catholic uh, theme to it. 
So I was a, I was a good Catholic boy up through high school, did everything you have to do to, <laughs> to, to earn that, you know, to earn those honors within Catholicism. Yes. I went to college to play football. And when I was out at, uh, 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 uh down in San Diego at a, at a college, I got involved more of an evangelical group. So there I was all excited, meeting with people, having a Bible study. And I'll tell you, the people at the evangelical group told me, oh, Ed, so glad you got out of that Catholic, you know, and they were just disparaging Catholicism. And I enjoyed my Catholicism. <laughs> and I looked at them going, really? And then when I went back to share with my father, you know, Father Anthony, I go, hey, I got a Bible now. I'm in a Bible study. He said, Eddie, beware those evangelicals. And then, you know, boom, 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 no, listening. Yeah, exactly. And yes. I, I thought to myself, I go, Guys, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm honoring the same cross, the same person of Jesus Christ. And yet both of those groups, evangelical and Catholic, saw each other as adversarial. I could not believe it. I mean, I was just like, really? We're going to bicker now between these? So, so that just kind of opened my eyes to, the, to just that tension, that religious tension there that's within, with, with, that the groups have towards each other. And that's what a lot of the kids say. They just go, man, oh man, you go into a place and they just backstab the other and they're, they're just sheep stealing people moving from one group to another. And it's just, uh, it's so sad. So yes, I, uh, I've been watching this now for almost 40 years. And finally, when I saw my kids struggling, I just said, you know what? Enough. We've got to talk about this. We've got to be open. We went through or probably in about the same age bracket and I was raised a Catholic as well, get on my bicycle every morning during the summer and ride my bike out to church to serve mass every day and went through all of that. And it's interesting that we all want to serve the same purpose, but we have open warfare as to how we go about it depending on the various religious groups. Do you find that young people, the, the younger people who are leaving, really don't want traditional doctrine? That's not something that motivates them in their religious journey. I, I do, yeah, because I think that a lot of the groups have taken some of the doctrine and they've used it, again, against certain elements of society. You know, these are the people who, you know, you— be, beware of, of this group and that group and that's wrong. I think that they have seen their religious group, which, whichever group they're part of, they've watched the leadership just do too much vilifying and too much holier than thou. And they, they just want more grace. They want more humility. Uh, I, again, and I really think that the gospel speaks more to that concept of unity and, and, and I mean, I, it's funny because I'm, I'm going to be making up some like mugs and different things to kind of sell. And, and I, I, my, I've come up with my, my thing, uh, my, my words are going to be simple religion. And it's just going to basically say the two greatest commandments, love God, love others. Simple enough. I mean, it's really <laughs> about that. It, yes, it, yes. Love God, love others. I mean, simple enough. That's what it should be. But they don't see that. They see the sadly, the judgmentalism that happens. Yeah, and what so many feel is, is the overcomplication. Uh, complication. I want to ask one more question before we run out of time here. Has, has, in some cases, organized religion become too much of a business? And I mention that because of megachurches. I'm reading all the time where they've got 6,000, they've got 15,000, they've got five different churches, and they serve 50,000 every weekend. When you're that big, do you sort of lose that that connection you have with the with, with the person you're talking to? You do, you, you do. And I, I had a, I had my wife and I were in Southern California, the beginning of our life, and we had uh, been a, uh, uh, we had been going to Saddleback uh, Church, Rick oh, Warren, yes. yep. and, and and I love Rick. I mean, I, I think he, I think he does a good job. But I think what we're seeing now is that as as the younger generations are coming up, they're they're the ones that are populating, I think, for the most part, these mega places. I think this is a last ditch effort by organized religion to do something that's stimulating, that's fun, that's kind of rock and rollish. And, and so I, I think it's a, it's worthy. My, my plea to them would be, please think about, you know, using something like simplifying religion or any one of the people in the country. There's many others that are trying to say, just just let's just simplify this, make it more about love God, love others, love God, love others. Keep keep it like that. And you're going to be able to stay healthy. Sadly, if they stay with some of the traditional stuff, even these large ones, I think are going to start to collapse. And then I think that's this is the last ditch effort in America 
to keep religion alive are these mega churches. And I pray that they're a little bit more younger, a little more progressive kind of leadership that'll hear, hear the message that we're trying to say. It's must reading Simplifying Religion by our guest on the program, Ed Galashevsky. That's G A L I. S-E-W-S-K-I. His book is Simplifying Religion, the formal title, the subtitle, Removing Barriers That Keep Us From God, Family, and Others. His website, very simple, simplifying. He does everything in a simple way. I like that. Simplifyingreligion.com is the website. Book it. Of course, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all of the usual places. Ed, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. A much-needed book where you take something that we've overcomplicated over the years and and break it down. It's very basic, simple enough. I I love that. So you can read a coffee mug mug and, and get your inspiration for the day and have you put your day in focus. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you, Rick. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. And our guest on the program again is Ed Galashevsky. The book is available at his website, simplifyingreligion.com. And that's the name of his book, Simplifying Religion. Of course, the information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Back on today's program, after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bechet, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.